Well, that's him. Good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I've told this story, you know, would not believe how many times I've told it. And the, uh, the real reason is to tell you what North Korea is really like. Have any of you ever been to China and taken a tour on to North Korea, the week tour? taken that trip, that tour, uh, people just are, are amazed at how good it is in Pyongyang, North Korea. And uh, the, the actual fact is every single person, North Korean, that they meet or see on the street or on a, on a bus or on the Pueblo are all purposely uh, Enter, uh, working for the North Korean government. They're all approved people. And when you get to Pyongyang, it's like you're walking in a, li a, a live play. The, uh, everything is staged completely. It doesn't matter how small it is, it's staged. You get, if you could, which you can't do, you can't get out into the countryside. And there is a completely different story. It's just decrepit. And it has not changed in 51 years. And uh, their lives are just dedicated to the Korean government, you know, the Korean People's Army. And they work on the, the farms and when their time comes, they die right there. They'll dig a hole and bury them. That's it. Or if, they, uh, if something else happened, if there was a security problem with someone, they'd wind up in a death camp on the Taedong River. <coughs> that camp is 10 miles. up the river from Pyongyang. It's on both sides. And they are, it is a giant death camp. They work until they die. And then that's it. Uh, so that's North Korea, and that's exactly what it was like when we were there. I've seen civilians practically killed by the people that are supposedly protecting them the Korean People's Army soldiers. Uh, and it's, it's just unbelievable. Anyway, uh, I would, should also ask you, uh, I'm su suspecting about 98% of the people here were lived through the infamous year of 1968. Is that correct? Yes. So you know all of that. Uh, when we were in North Korea, we only got the bad news when they wanted to give it to us. So our total news for the whole year was that the Vietnam, that uh, the Vietnamese were killing the American troops in Vietnam. That uh, on my birthday, April 4, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Later, Senator Kennedy was assassinated. It was rioting in the streets. The cities of the U.S. were in flames. And that was our, our news that we got from there. Oh, and there was one other thing that we had to know. The Vietnamese had shot God down with a missile. And they actually believed it. Well, they, you, you have no choice, you have to believe it. 
don't, don't question anything like that. But anyway, 1968 was, was a, a, a t uh, listed as an infamous year, and that's exactly what it was. Uh, anyway, uh, I joined USS Pueblo on uh, January 5, the day that they, it sailed out of Yokosuka, Japan, down to Sasebo, Japan, for a refit uh, before we went on the mission and then out into the Sea of Japan. Uh, I replaced a, uh, a man who had a appendicitis, and uh, he's still part of our group. He didn't make it to North Korea, but it didn't matter. He was a man of the, of the ship. So, Anyway, in the military, they say never volunteer. I had joined the Navy to see the world. I was a member of the Naval Security Group and based at Kamaseya, Japan. It's the largest uh, collection facility that the uh, U.S. Navy had at the time for intelligence collection. And we were mainly listening for uh, manual Morse from the Soviets and the, the Soviets, the Koreans, and the Chinese, and uh, also uh, voice transmissions, teletype transmissions, radar transmissions, all that. So we had about 2,500 men there just doing that continuously for uh, our three primary uh, targets. Uh, in late 67, uh, I volunteered for a 30-day mission on the USS Pueblo. I wound up becoming a life member of the 83-man crew, as well as a life member of disabled American veterans and American ex-prisoners of war. USS Pueblo is the refitted former World War II U.S. Army inter-island freighter FS-344 built in 1944 by Kiwanee Shipbuilding at Kiwanee, Wisconsin. The ship had spent time in the South Pacific during World War II, after which she went into the reserve, reserve fleet in California. In 1966, she was taken out. She also went to, to Korea during the Korean War, but that was for the Army. In 1966, she was taken out of mothballs to be converted at the Bremerton, Washington Naval Shipyard to an electronic intelligence collection vessel for the new Naval Security Group, exactly like her twin sister, USS Banner, AGER-1, in 1966. On May 13, 1967, she was christened United States Ship Pueblo, named her. Pueblo County, Colorado. USS Pueblo is 178 feet long. She weighs 780 tons, fully loaded. She's about the size of a seagoing tugboat. If you've seen the movie Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda and Jack Lemon, their ship USS Reluctant, you have seen Pueblo. Reluctant was an AKL in it also, and uh, that's the size of the thing versus what we wound up uh, having combat with. Oh, the only thing uh, that uh, we did not have was a palm tree. <laughs> Two GMC diesel engines gave our ship 12 knots Excuse me. <laughs> there. Come on. I I I muted it now. Oh. I have muted it. Okay. Okay.
Try it again. Hello, one, two, three, four, okay. Uh, uh, we had two, two diesel, uh, GMC diesel engines, gave us ship 12 knots, that's flank speed. Our sister USS Banner one time spent 24 hours in the Toshima Strait, which runs, be runs north and south between Japan and Korea going backwards two miles due to the wind and tide. Pueblo was unarmed until a few days before sailing on our first mission when 250 caliber machine guns were mounted, one on the starboard side railing, the other on the fantail railing. The guns were used Korean War vintage from a storage shed. Neither gun had been rebuilt. Each would fire four to five rounds before jamming. Our captain, Commander Pete Booker, Got a couple of empty 55-gallon drums for use in target practice. The safest thing on the sea that day was those drums. <laughs> and that's the truth. Pete, our skipper was Commander Lloyd Mark Pete Booker, USN. Pete was born at Pocatello, Idaho in 1927. Orphaned at a year old, he lived with two maiden aunts until he was seven. At the deepest part of the Depression, he was sent to the Sisters of Mercy or Orphanage. In 1940, Pete saw the movie Boys Town, starring Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney. He wrote a letter to Father Flanagan. Father sent the sisters $10 for Pete's bus ticket to Omaha. Immediately after graduation, from Boys Town in May 1945, Pete enlisted in the U.S. Navy, making it to quartermaster second class before, oh, excuse me, <laughs> before discharge in 1947. He entered the University of Nebraska in fall of 1947, graduating four years later with a degree in geology. Pete then rejoined the Army, uh, rejoined the Navy, after OCS at Newport, Rhode Island, he made a career in submarines. Pete was a true Navy Mustang. He loved enlisted men. And that's why enlisted men loved him. Pete's Pueblo's mission in January 1968 was to intercept North Korean military radio communications and air defense radars off four naval bases on the Korean East Coast. Sea of Japan for approximately 15 days. No United States Navy ship had ever attempted surveillance off the east coast of North Korea for, for that longer than half a day. Beginning at the northern port of Songjin, Pueblo would take a position 13 to 15 miles off the Korean coast. Now with our radar, our radio and radar receivers turned on, we listened and recorded signals over 12 days while slowly traveling south. Late on January 21st, we arrived off the North Korean port of Wonsan, the last point in a mission. The risk assessment given to our mission by the US Navy was minimal risk. That was printed in our sailing orders. Instead of having US Fifth Air Force jets on strip alert status or U.S. Navy destroyer over the horizon for support, as was provided to past USS banner missions off Red China and Soviet Union, there was none for us. Pueblo would be in international waters for her entire mission. The Navy would put its trust in the international law of the seas, dealing with the free passage of all ships in international waters. At 1,300 hours on January 23rd, the first of two North Korean SO-1 class subchasers approached at high speed to sit 200 yards off Pueblo's starboard beam, followed by four P-4 motor torpedo boats to cover Pueblo's port side fore and aft. The subchaser, with all guns turned directly on us, put up signal flags which were decrypted to read, heave to or I will open fire. Pueblo flew international flags for hydrographic operations. We were, we were a hove to. 
At the time, our two civilian oceanographers, Harry Iredale and Friar Tuck, were taking a series of water samples at various depths off the port side. We raised flags which read, thank you for your consideration. I am departing the area. The Koreans then flagged us, what nationality? Pete ordered Old Glory raised. Immediately it was bam, 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 repeated 57 millimeter fire from the SO-1, then machine gun fire coming from the MTB off the port stern. The Koreans were aiming at our bridge personnel and the radio antennas in an attempt to cut off our communications. Next two MiG-21 jet fighters firing rockets ahead of our ship blasted by at 500 feet. While trying to destroy classified material, one of our men was killed and wounded, including Pete, our skipper. We were in radio contact with my base at Kamasea, Japan, all the while. In addition to communications with Japan, we had sent out two messages using extreme emergency dis designator critic. These messages went <coughs> These messages went directly to the White House, plus all United States military commands. No help, no word of help ever came back to us. The last word from Japan, good luck. After two and a half hours of maneuvering while being obstructed and shot at by the sub chasers and the MTBs in our attempts to break free, Pueblo was finally boarded and our crew taken prisoners. The United States military's code of conduct was read to all hands over the ship's internal communication system. Sixteen hours later, we were in Pyongyang, capital of the De Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, with blindfolds and wire wrists, uh, wire, uh, wire wrist wraps removed. We were forced to run a gauntlet through hundreds of screaming, kicking, punching, spitting, Korean People's Army soldiers, all the while blinded by movie Klieg lights, bombarding the 5 a.m. scene with super bright light as a North Korean film crew captured the spectacle. Koreans needed confessions to justify their act of piracy. They needed them fast. Interrogations and beatings began immediately. Koreans feared a United States attack. We prayed for it. for many days. Our wounded were left waiting for eight or nine days before receiving any help whatsoever. Gangrene, maggots, stench. My friend fireman Steve Wolk was finally taken to a hospital where without anesthetics, they operated on his belly and leg wounds. After the operation, Steve was placed on the floor where he was presented with a bucket of water and a rag to clean up his own blood. You are spies, you will be shot day after day, week after week, month after month. It was beatings and threats of a trial as they looked for more confessions saying we had intruded into their territorial waters. Very early, Pete got word out to the crew, hold out as long as you're able. If you, if you have to, Spike a goddamn confession with as much American bullshit any way you can. See what you can get away with. Then let others know. The North Koreans were deficient in their knowledge of everything American. They had no idea, period. One night they showed us a movie. The couple of movies we had previously, previously seen dealt with the joy of life in the people's paradise the DPRK. That joy part always included killing U.S. imperialist warmonger soldiers who enslave our brothers and sisters in the South. <laughs> this time the, mo the movie was of a North Korean national soccer team in 1965 as they rode on a bus through downtown London, England. The bus had a large North Korean flag plastered on the side. A British gentleman, bowler hat and all, stood on the sidewalk where he was shown smiling and saluting the Korean athlete, athletes as the bus went by. He did it very 
with a very simple gesture. <laughs> Lost my place. <laughs> Day after day, uh, I'm sorry, the North Koreans were deficient in their, in their knowledge of everything American. They had no idea at all. Uh, they showed us the movie, and the, the uh, joy part always included killing the U.S. imperialist warmongers. This time, the movie was of the North Korean national soccer team as they rode through London, England. The British gentlemen displayed a significant finger to the bus, and the North Koreans photographed that in movies and stills and everything. They had it everywhere. <laughs> we giggled at what we saw. The Koreans had no idea why we were suddenly grinning and appeared to be happy. Thanks, Go. To that Brit, gentleman, oh God, thank that Brit. He gave us our weapon. The NKs had no idea what it was. They made one man stand to explain why we were laughing and pointing at the screen. He blurted out, well, that's the Hawaiian good luck sign. <laughs> and stuck up his right hand, middle finger, extended directly towards the colonel. Pete immediately, immediately shot up to tell the Koreans, Colonel, it means good luck. In America, automobile drivers display it all the time. And we're laughing like crazy while he's doing this. <laughs> the colonel, along with the interpreter Silverlips, Sat smiling, nodding in agreement. We had our we had our weapon. We stuck that bird everywhere. If the Koreans wanted a photo or a fi or a film, they got the bird. My friend and shipmate Brad Crow from Island Pond, Vermont, became a perfectionist at sticking it to the NKs whenever that goddamn Korean camera crew showed up. Now it's question and answer time. From Merriam-Webster's dictionary, dictionary, a five-letter word meaning praise. Anybody? Take a shot at it. Five-letter word meaning praise. P-A-E-A-N, pronounced peon. From Pete and his recorded confession it became I pee on Kim Il-sung, I pee on the DPRK, but especially I pee on the Korean People's Army. And they loved it. Because they could even look it up in a dictionary and it said praise. And they had no idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> so. We were given us all the news of 1968, Martin Luther King killed in Memphis on my 24th birthday, April 4, 1968. Robert F. Kennedy was killed in June in Los Angeles. There was rioting in U.S. cities, but the worst news of all, the North, North Vietnamese had shot God down with that damn missile. There, were more, there was more news, though. This time, it came over the camp speakers. Angelo Strano. Angelo Strano, there is news for Angelo Strano. Your brother John Strano, the imperialist U.S. Marine warmonger, has been killed in Vietnam by the victorious Vietnamese people. Everything became quiet for a long time. Time Magazine. The North Koreans spread their propaganda photos of our crew far and wide. In early October, Time Magazine got hold of a photo showing eight of our guys in one cell. Solemn faced in the photo, they displayed the Hawaiian good luck sign. <laughs> Time Magazine was kind enough to let the North Koreans know, quote, 
The crew of USS Pueblo know how to put one over on their North Korean captors. Time went on to describe in detail exactly what our guys were doing and finished with US Navy 1, North Korea 0. The North Koreans went into complete berserk mode. This was known to our crew as Hell Week. It was the most concentrated outright warfare towards our crew. After Times ex Exposé, the Koreans went back over all the photos and films they had taken and found the bird everywhere. <laughs> Luckily, we were not ex expert enough to find all that they were, they were not exp expert enough to find all the written confessions they extracted were filled with lies, insults, gibberish, American slang. We did find out after our release that our messages from North Korea were very much understood by the United States Navy, National Security Agency, and the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. Now, for the first time, our faces were targeted. Before that, they would only be on the body as they needed to keep faces clear for photos. Officers and guards with bayonets mounted on their AK-47s were given unrestricted free reign. The real worry for us now was that the Koreans might actually beat a man to death. They came very close until a little Marine sergeant from New Hampshire, my friend Bob Hammond, saved us. Sergeant Hammond was put in by, by Pete for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Two days later, the 24-hour mayhem stopped completely. In came Koreans with trays of towels and hard-boiled eggs. They showed us how to rub away the bruises and the swelling. Next, it was new, new clothes and food, plenty of it, real food. Our first in 11 months, not slop. Lastly, it was the all orifice check for contraband. Spread your cheeks, both sets. <laughs> Had to do that in front of these smiling, oh, Jesus. The North Korean right hand had no idea what the left hand had, com had completed negotiations with the United States Command for our release. 11 months, 335 days, on 23 December 68, United States Army Major General Gilbert Woodward the UN Command Chief Negotiator signed a phony confession. It contained a handwritten disclaimer by General Woodward. I am signing this North Korean document to free the crew and only to free the crew. And I have to tell you the truth. This is the exact same paper that he was presented with, with, well, his predecessor was presented with four days after our capture. 335 days later, somebody finally signed the goddamn thing. Two days before this was the very first time the North Koreans had stated they would release the crew in the, if the U.S. signed their 11-month-old phony confession. One hour later, we began a carefully staged walk across the bridge of no return at Panmunjom in the middle of the DMZ Korea. The same bridge, American, Korean War, POWs crossed to freedom in 1953. One man every 30 seconds. America's one man every 30 seconds. Pete, the first across, identified the body of Fireman Dwayne Hodges. Our XO Ed Murphy was the last man to cross. To this day, Ed Murphy is the last man to walk across that bridge to freedom. While we crossed the bridge, the North Koreans' propaganda sound system spewed out one last blast across the DMZ. As I walked slowly across, I heard an echoing, I pee on Kim Il-sung. I pee on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. I especially pee on the Korean People's Army. 
In the North Korean War, there were 7,140 uh, 7, Americans held prisoner of war by North Korea. 2,701 of those Americans died in captivity. These figures do not include the thousands of South Korean and United Nations member country personnel also held captive. At my brief debriefing in San Diego, I was informed that our jailer, the senior colonel we called Super C, and later Glorious G when he made general, after he appeared with gigantic silver stars on his shoulder boards, was in fact the infamous Major Pack, who was in charge of all LA prisoners during the Korean War. You may have noticed I used the uh, present tense in speaking of Pueblo. In fact, my ship USS Pueblo AGER-2 is a commissioned ship of the United States Navy to this day. She is in fact the oldest ship in active commission behind only USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, birthed at the Charlestown Navy Yard, Boston, Massachusetts. Presently, USS Pueblo resides in a concrete encasement on the canal next to the Victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum in Pyongyang, North Korea. The uh, Liberation War, uh, that they fought supposedly is the Korean War and they won. Gee, go figure. <laughs> that war, by the way, is the Korean War, which they claim to have won. Then, of course, the North Vietnamese claim to have shot God down with the missile. God bless you all for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. It has been an honor to be with you. And if you have any questions, fire away. Any questions? And by the way, we never intruded into their territorial waters. We have, our mission assignment was stated exactly, the closest you can go is 13 miles, they claim 12. We never went, and we never hit 13. We did go down like 13 and three quarters. That's all, just to turn around. But th that's it. But the Koreans, they, they have no, they don't care. Yep. Did the U.S. military ever explain why there was never any protection for that ship? No. It was, well, yes and no. It was a giant screw-up. I, I was in the Navy, by the way, but when this was happening, and that's what I heard, that it was a major screw-up. The, uh, the uh, head of the uh, Navy Department in Japan uh, oh God, what's his name? Admiral, uh, God, I forget it. Uh, it. We had questioned, Pete had questioned the lack of protection. Banner before us had protection everywhere it went. And uh, it was always a destroyer just over the horizon or it was jets on strip alert ready to fly out of Korea or Japan. And uh, with us, it, it just said, you know, support none, N-O-N-E. That was it. And there was no changing it. And so that, that was basically it. He finished his career, and we sat in North Korea. Well, they didn't get the Pueblo into Panmunjom. No, it's into Pyongyang, the capital. It's the Pueblo now sits, they call it a river, it's really a, a slough off the Taedong River. The original uh, toiletries in Pyongyang were using 
these sloughs to get the waste away downstream into the uh, East, sea of Ch uh, East uh, China Sea. And uh, there's some beautiful pictures I have <laughs> of Pueblo sitting in this, this supposed, what they call what they call a river, was when in the heat of summer it's blazing total yellow. And that tells you exactly what's in that river. And uh, well, I will tell you another thing. The, uh, the first place they kept us the, uh, uh, in North Korea, in the barn, as we called it, because it was a, it was a six-story granite building in downtown Pyongyang. And we know this only from present day Google Earth. And we found uh, the two places where we were held, the, far the barn and then eventually taken to the farm 10 miles south out in the country. Uh, but the, the uh, barn, the, the toiletry facilities were stalls set up, elevated, so you walked into a stall. There was a door you could close, and there was a hole, just a hole. That's it. If you've been in any of the, the bars in Tokyo or Yokohama, they're the, the exact same thing. But these, they had a light down below in these things, and you could see this pile. And the stench was absolutely unbelievable. It was so bad. You just want to throw up right then. And, you know, I, they're totally used to it. They had, they had no choice. <laughs> so, but when we got to the, the uh, to the farm, at least it was a little bit better. It, it did have a, a flushable toilet. God knows where it went, but. <laughs> yeah. So we know that in the Navy really ever honed up, screw up, blah, uh, How about Time Magazine? Did they ever take? Nothing. So we didn't get any compromise. Zero. Zero. Tried it. Nothing. No answers. You know that that you know you can. I don't care what your politics is is, because it, it goes on both sides of the thing. You know whoever's supporting whoever you know, or whatever in the news organizations. No, they can say what they want, but unless you can sue them, that's the only you know recall you've got. So, but it, we can't sue them for this. So. We'll just let it let it slide. Ralph, you have a fiftieth. Uh, you just had a fiftieth reunion of the, of the Pueblo. Last year in in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, and I didn't go. I couldn't make it. I, thanks to the fabulous diet, in North Korea. The uh, primary thing we got when we first got there was. A, uh, a piece cut out of a fish that we called sewer trout. If, you're, if you've ever seen a horn pout that has two horns coming out of the side, well, this was a horn pout with another one coming out of the top. So there's three of them, three of these things. That with three slices of cucumber and dirty water in a, the, the, oh, they have to boil the water all the time. Everywhere we were, it was they had to boil the water all the time. So it was full of, of uh, wood, dirt, sand, everything. And th that's the only water we had to drink. They put us to work in the, at, when we were at the farm because they had some fruit trees there. So they wanted the fruit trees trimmed and everything. And we trimmed them with our tools. We got the same tools that a, that a uh, Korean citizen gets. 
And one of the things was a pen knife. That pen knife, a little mirror, a toothbrush, a tube of toothpaste, and that was it. So that's what every Korean citizen gets every year, apparently. But So anyway, I would not recommend, if you ever get to China and you see or are approached about, you know, going to North Korea, please don't. Did, did the Navy provide you with any counseling when you returned home? Uh, the VA. VA. The VA did, yeah. I, the reason I didn't go to the 50th uh, anniversary reunion and this is the first one I've ever missed. I have uh, neuropathy. And it, this first came to light to me in October 1968. My feet were burning and were numb. And it has just progressed. And now over the last six months, it's been accelerated because of due to the arthritis in the lower feet and, and legs. And so I'm not exactly stable all the time. When you got back to the States, did you stay in the Navy? No. Nope. <laughs> I had been through, now wait a minute, you know, this guy said, you know, you don't need any backup, don't worry about it, you know. So no, no, I, I actually had planned on doing some extensions just to get rank and everything but I would ultimately go home to help my mother my father had died so I would go home to help my mother and where was that when you went home uh, Milton Massachusetts just south of Boston and you formed a company in, in, uh, in Burlington we had uh, my wife Myself and uh, another partner that we, we were working with at the time, uh, we worked at Channel 22 in Burlington. And uh, we left there and started our own company, uh, production, broadcast production, broadcast editing, everything. And we had that for 25 years and we sold out to our partner. When I, I could retire, I said, sayonara. <laughs> I'm out of this place. And I, I recommend to everybody, if you're not retired yet, get retired. Believe me. Believe me. Excuse me. Do you have a, you have a personal feeling about our current president's visit to North Korea? Uh, Korea? Well, I, I didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> Upsetting to see that. Oh, yeah. But he did one good thing to us, for us. He put North Korea back on the, uh, the uh, terrorism list. So that allowed us to uh, sue North Korea. And that's working its way through the system right now. So we hope the place, they don't, put, the North Koreans don't pay. Uh, they don't even acknowledge the, the lawsuit or anything. Don't, they, they get served and they just throw it in the trash. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, any funds that, that we could get come from the, uh, what the, the State Department collects from fines on uh, companies who have sold uh, product to uh, blacklisted countries. And they used the American dollars any time, practically, if you went from uh, Iran and you bought something from Swiss, a Swiss company, that money, when it's changed on the, on the system, on the economical system now, it appears at one time in U.S. dollars. As soon as that appears in dollars, Nail them, and they, they nail them with billion dollar fines, and they pay. So, uh, 
Let's go. Have one question. When you were captured, that was about the time of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Did you know anything about it? Nothing. It was after, it was a couple of weeks after. The, the, uh, the history of 1968 is USS Pueblo, uh, Quezon, Tet Offensive, uh, Martin Luther King, Kennedy, the cities burning, and then the Vietnamese shot God down with a missile. That's it. Thank you.